So obedience was going to bring rise to a certain outcome. I'm going to quickly read. Are we recording? Okay. The title of our message today is The Cross Restored Obedience. Amen. Before we go into the word, can we just pray and, and, and acknowledge and acknowledge God, acknowledge the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, mighty God, we thank you. Father, we are humbled, O oh God, that you called us, O oh mighty Father, into your kingdom for your will. We thank you, mighty Father, that you paid the price for us. You restored us. You reconciled us with you. And almighty Father, through Christ Jesus, you enabled us to do all things. So we thank you, mighty God, as we are about to read your word, almighty Father. May you bless the reading of your word. I humble myself, almighty God, before you. As I lower myself, Holy Spirit, rise. May you speak through me this evening. May you minister your word. May your will be done. May your word achieve what it's set out to achieve. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Let us... Uh, our reading will, will be from the book of Genesis 2:15 to 17. But this will basically speaks to the disobedient part that resulted in Christ having to come. And in his obedience, we then were restored. But also, <clears throat> not only were we restored... But through his obedience, obedience was restored in us. So our journey of restoring obedience on the cross is triggered in Genesis 2.15 when God gives a commandment to Adam. And it leads us to the cross and the importance of obedience of Christ to undo the disobedience of Adam. It is highlighted in the book of Luke 22, verse 42. So can we just turn to Genesis 2? Verses 15 to 17. I will be reading from New King James Version. Amen. And it reads as followed. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of God and of, of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now we all know the story of creation from first Genesis when God creates, um, where God says, let's create man in our image and in our likeness. And then he further goes um, in Genesis 2 when he forms man from dust. And then man becomes a living spirit when God breathes the breath of life into him. So we fast forward now and God has now created Adam. And Adam is in, is in the garden. 
And God, as he places him in the garden, he then commands him. He says to him, you can eat of all the trees that are here in the garden, but there's this one specific tree where he says to him, you should not eat it. You should not eat from. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree. So it's a commandment. God tells Adam that, Adam, listen, don't eat. This one, don't touch, don't eat. But then, and because of that, and then God further goes and he creates Eve, but he further goes to say in Genesis 2.25, men felt no shame. So when God created Adam and Eve and they saw and they were naked, they were not ashamed. So men felt no shame. So he was okay because at that time he was still obedient to God. He was still obeying the commandment that God had given him. Now, when you have time, you can go through Second uh, Genesis and Genesis 3, because the crux of it, of creation, it then is unveiled to us in a much clearer way. So I'm just going to touch on parts of the scriptures in, in Second Genesis as I, I have already. And then I'll go into Genesis 3 and also touch on parts of the keys. So in Genesis 3, 7, the commandment is then disobeyed. In Genesis 3, 7, let me just quickly turn into it. So I can read it. I don't want to paraphrase it because we might just miss the essence of it. And I'll start from 16. Then it says, And the Lord God commanded men, You are free to eat from any tree. This is not the right scripture. This is Genesis 2. My apologies. Three, seven. Amen. I'll start from six. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took off its fruit and ate. She also gave her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. Now, this is where Adam disobeys God. And this is where Adam, suddenly, he is now ashamed. Because of disobedience, he is now ashamed. So, Adam here is like a child who knows he's not supposed to do wrong, but he continues to do wrong. Because God had told him that this tree, don't touch. All of them, feel free. You can eat as much as you want. Take care of the garden. But I command you, do not touch. It's like a little child when you say, do not put your finger in the heater. And they put the finger. And they get burned. And we see Adam being burned by his actions. 
his sight is suddenly open and now he's able to see. But not only is he able to see, but now he's ashamed and is also fearful. Now disobedience brought shame and fear to Adam. Because the Bible also tells us that when, when he hears God walking in the garden, I'm trying to picture it because, you know, God is spirit and he's walking. So I'm, but God is bold and he's present everywhere. So he's, he's clearly audible when he walks because there's that connection. There's that intimate relationship between Adam and God. But for the first time, he is fearful of God because he knows what he has done. And God being God, and I think when I was preparing, the picture of a parent kept on coming to me where you hear the silence. And when you hear the silence and you know that where the kids are, they are up to no good. So I, I just pictured God walking around knowing that Adam has been up to no good. And he calls up to him knowing where he is because he's an omnipresent God. And he's an all-knowing God. So he calls to him not, not because he does not know where he is, but because he has felt it that he is, Adam is no longer where he is supposed to be. Hallelujah. But I like what God says because after he calls out to, to Adam, Adam responds. And Adam says, like a guilty child, so he said, this is Genesis 3.10, I heard your voice in the garden and as I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. So already he's confessing with hey, I was disobedient. But God being God, he <laughs> like a typical parent, God is loving. Yeah. He then says to him, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the, true, the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? Now God already knew that Adam had been disobedient. Now, what happens subsequent to this is where sin is ignited. So everything that now happens is a consequence of the disobedience. So the transgression that the Bible speaks about is not the separation, but it is actually the disobedience. That I said to you, do not touch, you touched, and because now you have touched, these are the consequences. And everyone who comes after you is suffering the consequences of your disobedience. So we continue on this walk of disobedience as descendants of Adam. Moses comes to the picture and we are already in sin. But he then being, brings the law into play. And as much as God is with him because one of the major things that happened is that we were then disconnected. God kicks out Adam. Acts it from the garden. And not because he's angry, no, but because of his own good. He says to him, God says to himself that if I keep him, he might just eat from the tree of life and he will live eternally in separation with me. 
and, and God does not want that. So because his son has wronged, but he does not want to, to keep him there where he is constantly reminded of his wrongdoing, he then says, He takes him out of the garden. He protects him. Because that's what parents do. And God being the ultimate parent, he then takes him out for his own sake. But God already has a, a plan, a foolproof plan, which he, in the beginning, is ordained, where he, now he wants to restore his disobedience. But not only does he want to restore the disobedience of Adam, but he wants to restore the disobedience, which is now a consequence to all the creation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So God, Abraham comes in, uh, sin becomes, law becomes alive now because of sin. Moses comes, God ordains Moses, says, here are my people, the Israelites. Take them out of slavery. God takes them out of slavery. But there's a part where God says to them, they are stiff-necked people. This disobedience is following them. And now it's, it's also continuing to manifest that although God took them from a very difficult place in Egypt, he showed them signs and wonders. He performed miracles. He opened the the seas, so that they may walk. He, he destroyed Pharaoh. Yet, his chosen people continue to be disobedient. Such was the disobedience that Moses, who was called into the presence of God, in anger, also disobeyed God. Because God said to him, when he, they wanted water, he said to him, he must go and speak to the rock. But Moses, in anger, struck the rock. And they're disobeying God. So God then decided that, you know, there is nothing that can be done by my people. I am their father. And because I am their father, I now need to teach them the importance of them obeying me. But they are not able to obey me. So I'm going to have to come up with a plan where I now take the word which is going to become flesh and it, which is going to walk on earth because God, when he created us, he created us with a purpose. So the purpose of the word was also to restore us. He then forms us from dust. So he creates a, a, a form of legitimacy here on earth. And he says, here on earth, you are king. And for you to be able to do anything, you need this dust body. Now God, let's remember because this is, this, this is also mind-blowing because if a God who created all things, who he existed before all things, who is creation and he exists outside of creation, is now coming to his own creation and he's obeying the very rules that he came up with. So he says, okay, uh, word, go down there. 
Now, word, I want you to be the ultimate atonement. I want you to restore what my first creation, Adam, was not able to do, which is obey. And so in, in him not being able to obey me or disobedience, he then brought sin. But I want your word to be born of a woman. And I want you to walk in obedience. Because remember, Christ was without sin. Christ was, was not born was not born of a physical lineage of Adam. So he was, he, he was not of the bloodline. He was of a unique bloodline. A superior bloodline. So he comes. So the disobedience that brought rise to the separation it's the disobedience. But God's foolproof plan was to be restored through the cross by obedience. So we see in Luke 22, 40, 42 to 43, and also in Hebrews 5, verse 8 to 9, obedience. So as Christ is walking, and I don't want to, to prolong this because if, if, if we go into the walk of Christ and we learn of exactly how he walked, we then become aware that his walk was not of an ordinary walk. His walk was a walk of obedience. It was like when he was walking, he was not looking here as we walk, but he was looking there. He was looking at the cross. Yet he was looking beyond the cross as well because his obedience was the start to the cross. It was the start to remove sin and separation. So, obedience was going to bring rise to a certain outcome. I'm going to quickly read in the book of Luke 22, from verses 42 to 43. Because this then speaks to the obedience. It speaks to the obedience of Christ. And I'm reading from a different translation now. The Passion translation. And I like the way it, it, it simplifies the words just speak for themselves. And in Luke 22 verse 42, he then says, this is Christ praying. He says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup of agony away from me. But no matter what your will must be mine. And Jesus called for an angel of glory to strengthen him. And the angel appeared. Now this tells us two things. It tells us that the extent of the agony, of the agony that Christ was in was so much that it was overbearing. 
But because he had the end inside, he was looking beyond. He then says, not my will. Because Christ did not come on his own accord, but he came on the Father's accord. And he came to restore disobedience. And because he came to restore disobedience, it was not going to be easy. Because not only was he carrying the disobedience, but now he was also carrying the consequences of disobedience. So he had to then remove and go back. Remove, go all the way to Adam and say, mm, yes, you disobeyed, but I'm restoring. I am removing the sin and its consequences. I am removing that unpleasant stench of sacrifice through generations. I am removing the stench of disobedience of mankind. I am removing the stench of the sacrifice that was superficial, that did not come to the essence of the disobedience. It no, never came to override the disobedience which Christ came to do. In Hebrews 5, 8, 9, it also says, but even though he was a wonderful son, he learned to listen and obey through all his suffering. So Christ did not suffer for nothing. His suffering had a purpose. And his suffering was not a short-lived suffering. But it was a continuous suffering. It was like he was reliving what God was going through when he was observing his creation. When he was observing the disobedience of his creation. When he was observing the sinful nature that has become all of that Christ had to carry. As a son, in the flesh, he had to learn to be obedient. In verse 9 it says, And after being proven perfect in this way, he has now become the source of eternal salvation to all those who listen to him and obey. So, Bazalwane, here, this is what I'm hearing that when Christ came, he came not only to, to save us, but he also came to restore. Obedience. Because when we believe in Christ, we are then beginning to obey. We are beginning to obey the Son of God who became a sacrifice. We, we obey the Son of God who has restored obedience. But I like the revelation that the Apostle Paul gets when he's writing his letter to the church in Rome. Because it, it, it coins the consequence of disobedience and it takes us all the way to obedience and what 
obedience of Christ actually has done for us. So in Romans 5, verse 12 to 16, then Paul says, when Adam sinned, the entire world was affected. Sin entered human experience and death was the result. So sin entered. Death was the, the, was the outcome. And so death followed the sin, casting its shadow over all humanity because all have sinned. Sin was in the world before Moses gave the written law. But it was not charged against them where no law existed. So sin was in existence. So from the Garden of Eden, sin existed. And sin continued. Fourteen. Yet death reigned as king from Adam to Moses, even though they hadn't broken a command the way Adam had. The first man, Adam, was a picture of the Messiah who was to come. Now there is no comparison between Adam's transgression, disobedience, And the gracious gift I'm going to go back to 15 again. It says, now there is no comparison between Adam's transgression and the gracious gift that we experience. For the magnitude of the gift far outweighs the crime. So in essence, the disobedience and the obedience were not equal. The obedience outweighed the disobedience. What Christ did outweighed what Adam did. The grace outweighed disobedience. So, in the grace outweighing disobedience, it then completely gets rid of disobedience and puts us back to when God gave us the command. So, God not only wipes away our sins, but he takes us back to before there was disobedience. And this we achieve in the cross. Amen. So it is in the cross where obedience overcomes disobedience. It is what Christ did. But Paul of Feather continues and he says, It's true that many died because of one man's transgression, but now much greater will God's grace and his gracious gift of acceptance overflow to many because of what one man Jesus, the Messiah, did for us. And this free flow, flowing gift imparts to us much more than what was given to us through the one who sinned, which is Adam. For because of one transgression, we are all facing a death sentence with a verdict of guilty. But this gracious gift leaves us free from our many failures and brings us into the perfect righteousness of God. 
acquitted with the words, not guilty. So, Lana Bazalone, Paul in essence is saying, Christ just did so much than we can even comprehend. Because here we were thinking he just came for our sins. But here Paul is saying, ah, uh -uh. are the consequences. He came to deal with the source, the source which was disobedience. So Tina, we inherited, Yena, he's coming to deal with our inheritance and he's saying, no, 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 no. This is not your inheritance. Your inheritance is what God said in Genesis 1, 27. That is our inheritance. So Christ is, is saying, this is not your portion. God is saying to us, this, is, this was never your portion to begin with. Your portion was for you to be connected to me, to be fruitful, to multiply, and to have dominion, and to replenish. God has called us to be obedient. Not on our own accord because we unfortunately, as much as we are restored in the spirit, we are suffering the consequences of this, the flesh. This is what needs to be renewed. This is what daily needs to be renewed with the word of God. It is the word of God and the Holy Spirit that needs to agree in us for us to get a clearer revelation of the Father. Because you see, if we are created in the image of God, the image of God being spirit, and we have been disconnected through generations because of sin, we have then learned the sinful way of things. Our mind has been trained in the sinful way of things. And only the word of God with the Holy Spirit is then able to restore the image of God in us. So, Bazalone, it is in the obedience of Christ that today we stand and we are called the children of God. It humbles me because this happened 2,000 years ago. And in 2,000 years ago, none of us were here. But Christ paid that price. He paid that price not for just Adam, but he paid it for all God's creation. He paid it for those who came after Adam. He paid it for those who came after him. So in the cross, when he was hanging there. I mean, you know, the marvel of, of Christ and what he has done for me is that when he was hanging on the cross, just picture this. His friend, Judas, betrays him. But he's still fine with it. He continues. His other good friend, Peter, says to him, he says, Jesus says to Peter, Peter, you are going to deny me three times. Peter says, ah, ah. But he continues. I mean, he, 
He knows these things will happen. Can you imagine you standing on the railway track and you see the train is coming? What are you going to do? Because hmm. Nama was going to run. But Christ sees beyond the train. He sees beyond all of these things that we by flesh are seeing. He is seeing first Genesis, Genesis 1.27. He is seeing what was created in the image of the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. That's what Christ was seeing. So when Christ was seeing the cross, yet it was, it was agonizing to his flesh, and it was agonizing to him because as he was hanging on the cross, he shouts and he says, Father, why have you forsaken me? But we now know that what actually had been removed from him was the presence of God, which is the Holy Spirit. So as he was standing there, it was him alone and he was disconnected from the Holy Spirit. But already he had asked God to say, Father, you know, I know what is going to happen. I know. I, Bona, I know. And it is painful now. But, but, Father, give me the strength to obey you. Give me that strength to obey you. For, not, not, not for me, but for your creation. For your word, because, Father, you, you are faithful. You are a faithful, Father. And because you are loving, yes, they have sinned. Yes, they were disobedient. They did not listen to you when you told them that you are going to get hurt. But, Father, I am willing to carry out what you said I must carry out. I am willing to be obedient. I am willing to stand and be the ultimate sacrifice. Mazalone, this is the word of God. This is what God has said and prepared for us today. Let us stand and, and give thanks to God. Let us give thanks to Christ. You know, such is the love. Such is the love of Christ that... You know, in the, in the book of Isaiah, I think it, it, it paints a, the true picture where it says, not only was he bruised, but his skin was, was removed. And this was done in obedience. So I just wanna, want for us to take this time and to thank Christ for restoring obedience. For dealing with disobedience and its consequences. For becoming the ultimate sacrifice. For paying for all of it that we may get a not guilty verdict. Let us pray. Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your love. We thank you, mighty God, that 
Though we were disobedient, O mighty Father, being the loving Father that you are, O mighty God, you did not discard us, O mighty God, but O mighty Father, you paid the ultimate price by give, giving us your Son as the ultimate sacrifice. To not only, mighty Father, to deal with the separation which was a consequence of our disobedience, O oh Lord, but you dealt with the disobedience itself. Oh, yes, Lord, we thank you. We thank you, mighty God, that on the cross, by the disobedience of Christ, by the disobedience of the last Adam, all was restored. And by all, Almighty Father, we are talking of the image, the image, O oh God, that you created us in was restored. We thank you, mighty God, that we receive a new inheritance to Christ. That we are able to walk in obedience. That, O oh God, we are made righteous. That, O oh Lord, we are rendered obedient. Not, O oh God, because of our own accord, but, O oh Father, because of the completed works of Calvary. We thank you, Lord, that Almighty Father, as we live, we walk, O oh God, in obedience through Christ Jesus. Father, give us that understanding that, O oh God, it is not what we do but it is what Christ did. <laughs> that, oh God, because of what Christ has done and us continue, continuously seeking your kingdom, it is then, oh God, that we become the manifestation of obedience. We thank you, mighty God. We thank you for your restoration. We thank you, mighty God, that we are now back to obedience. And as we continue to walk in Christ, we walk in obedience. As we continue to obey to the instructions of the Holy Spirit, as we continue to seek the instructions of the Holy Spirit, We are rendered obedient. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.